Well, good morning. It's good to be back uh, with my spiritual family here in Tosa. It's uh, nice to see so many of you again. Um, again, my name is James, and this time I came back with my family, and uh, so you, you could meet them as well. I've got two little blondies running around, probably running around in the street or in the parking lot, so if you could do me a favor and rope them in, that'd be great. I want to begin this morning with, uh, with I'm kind of a tech nerd and an artist, and so if uh, you are, you probably already know about this, but I don't know if you know about uh, AI-generated art. Um, so it's, it's pretty mind-bending, and it gets me super excited, a little bit disheartened, honestly. But um, one, one example is Dolly 2. It's an artificial intelligence that generates unique artwork from simple text descriptions. So it might be some, you might type in something like a teddy bear riding a skateboard in Times Square. Or uh, you might type in an impressionist oil painting of a woman in a long white dress with a pink parasol surrounded by evil robots. And, and, and it basically, it's this, just kind of this giant brain that sifts through the whole of the internet to, to create these uh, images. It turns your words into photorealistic images or artwork that have literally never existed before that moment. Right? It's not like piecing together this and that and creating, you know, this. It's just like this has never existed before. Anyway, so if that like kind of breaks your brain, you're in good company. I, over the past month, I've just like been just, just this is pretty much all I've been doing. And, and so I should have been preparing for the message. Anyways, that's all I've got. So uh, I'll see you next time I go. Okay, so I've been playing around and here are the results of some prompts I've previously typed in. A painting of a pouting pug in a party hat by Frida Kahlo. Or maybe you like it in the style of Van Gogh. That's more your thing. And if you zoom in on this stuff too, you can get like the, 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 the paint brush strokes. It's just crazy. Uh, a person surfing the great wave off Kanagawa in the style of a Japanese woodblock print. A Kodachrome photo of people observing an Egyptian artifact in a museum. How about the Mona Lisa but with the face of a squirrel? by Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> or if you were here last time I preached, a quokka throwing its baby at a dingo. See, it happens. A painting of Jesus by Rembrandt. Some really pretty stuff. Or maybe like Ricky Bobby, you prefer your, your Jesus is eight pounds, six ounce, don't even know a word yet, newborn infant wearing a golden fleece diaper. Scary stuff. Or maybe you like your Jesus to pack more of a punch, right? You're, you might type in Jesus riding a green fire-breathing dragon while shooting lasers out of his eyes in space. Yeah, let's hope we're on the right side of the rapture. Artists probably aren't quite out of a job yet. And it's not just text, actually. I found out uh, that you can actually upload a picture. If you were to want to, like, troll your pastor and upload their face. It creates variations of their face. There's some handsome guys up there, but I'm sticking with the original recipe. So I thought it would be kind of fun if, if we were to sort of crowdsource an image together and uh, create a piece of art as a community. So uh, we're going to do that live and in real time. Let's fingers crossed. Hope this is appropriate and works. But um, so just shout out like some adjectives or some nouns, just like piece, let's piece together a piece of art. What do you got? The pack, of course. We're... <laughs> All right, let's do it. Okay, so what is this, a photo of the Packers or is this a, a painting of the Packers? Okay, what kind of painting? Ooh, surrealist painting of the Packers. What, what winning tonight? Yeah, yeah, of course, like, man, come on, break free, you guys, like, the, okay, okay, so the Packers doing what? Wait, the Packers, okay, well, I like the chicken nuggets thing, eating, no, with painting of the Packers wearing helmets, 
made of chicken nuggets. <laughs> nuggets in a blizzard. All right, okay. So here we go, a surrealist painting of the Packers wearing helmets made of chicken nuggets in a blizzard. Let's see what happens. So it's supposed to do this in less than 10 seconds. Let's see what we get. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> okay, so it's some pretty strange stuff we've got here. That one looks like a demon. Okay, so you see how it's like trying to piece together the Packers. See, it's never done this, but it's never thought, hey, the Packers and chicken nuggets. <laughs> okay. All right, so we're going we're gonna to do one more. We're going to do one more. Uh, let's do, um, so that was a painting, right? Didn't really look like a painting, but we can do, what if we did like a film photograph? This is where we find out I can't spell. So... What else? A film photograph of what? A dog riding a bicycle with a cat on its shoulders. Shoulders giving a peace sign. <laughs> what did you say? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but I'm pretty sure I know what that is. <laughs> okay, so a film photograph of a, of a dog riding a bicycle with a cat on its shoulders giving a peace sign. Okay, so this is not quite it, but that's the one I'm going with. <laughs> We're just going to leave that up. I'm just kidding. So if you could try to break away from the realization that nothing's real anymore and that the world is, in fact, being taken over by machines, here's my point. That the image you end up with is nothing more than the amalgamation of the input that it's being given. It's an image limited by the person or the group of people making the query, right? And if that group of people is homogenous, which it most likely and often is, it's an image that's even more limited. Um, to distill my main point, it's this. What's created is an image bound by the limitations of the creator. And I wonder if what we're doing now to art is similar to what the Israelites were doing in the wilderness to God, and perhaps what we're still doing to God. When I was a kid in Sunday school, uh, my teacher, she came in one day holding up a picture that looked like this. We were, stole, we were told a story from Exodus 32 about how the Israelites, they were unfaithful to God while Moses was up on Mount Sinai and they started to worship some other God represented by this golden calf. And, uh, of course, uh, they, they, cre they created this idol. This made God very angry, right? And the moral of the story was don't worship other gods, a violation of the first commandment. The traditional application was always don't worship idols in our life. Maybe that's money, sports, <laughs> things, or ourselves, our possessions, right? Um, and and uh, but, but it's, it's always sort of seemed shallow to me, right, this application, because I couldn't figure out why these Israelites who were just rescued from Egypt by this very clearly powerful and kind of terrifying God would be so quick to trade him for this seemingly random choice of livestock. I mean, what were they thinking? Well, a friend gave me some insight into this story, and, and with relatively little understanding of the Hebrew alphabet, this very old story begins to take on entirely new meaning. In fact, all we need to know is one letter, meet the Aleph. This is what it looks like today in modern script. It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And um, it, like Roman numerals, Hebrew letters often held numeric value, and the Aleph's number was one, thus alluding to its preeminence. It's a silent letter, suggesting its ineffable nature. Only when other letters were added to it was it even pronounced. Standing alone, the Aleph, like other Hebrew letters, held meaning, and it meant strength, it meant power, it meant leader, and even the oneness of God. 
this letter served as a foundation for names like Adonai or Elohim, which mean the Lord and God. Now, as you know, language evolves over time. But so if we stepped back in time, the Aleph's more primitive form looked like this. Flip it over, and it starts to look really familiar, right? It's where we get our letter A. In fact, um, the, the second letter of the Hebrew alpha, alphabet is Bet, al- Aleph Bet. It's where we get Alpha Bet. So when we say Alpha Bet, we're really just saying A, B, right? So this is uh, its more primitive form. Now, stepping back even further in time to the time of this Exodus story, the Aleph in its original form, was a pictograph, a pictograph of an animal that looked like this. All of a sudden, this seemingly random choice of livestock they were worshiping doesn't seem so random after all. This letter was associated very closely with God. Now, if you're reading this in some of the English translations, uh, it says that while Moses was gone, the Israelites, they, they started to panic and, and demanded that Aaron, R- Moses' right-hand man, uh, would make gods for them. But if you're reading this in the or- original Hebrew script in the Torah, it, it says, uh, Asa Elohim, that, they, that he should create God for them. The result was this golden calf, this bowl. And the next day, these Israelites, they even threw a party to the Lord uh, in front of this statue to commemorate it. So what if the offense of the Israelites wasn't that they created an image of some other God, but that they tried creating an image of the God, not trading him, just kind of changing him? Not a violating, uh, you know, the first commandment not to worship other gods, but a violation actually of the second commandment not to create an image of anything in heaven. With the Canaanite god El being a bull, the Ammonite god Molech being a bull, the Egyptian god uh, Apis, whose spirit was in, you probably guessed it, a bull. It's a load of bull. Perhaps Aaron was trying to make God, like, culturally relevant into an image people could wrap their mind around, into an image they liked, that would appeal to the masses. And and this raises the question, are we doing the same thing? I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get a, a bit uncomfortable with a God. I can't always, you know, wrap my mind around, right, or contain. Isaiah says that who can possibly measure the spirit of the Lord? And then later, King Solomon, he sees the irony of building a temple for God when he says, in the heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple that I've built. I mean, as if to say, God, I will misrepresent you in anything I create. Our God has this immeasurable and uncontainable spirit. And the scripture says that he does immeasurable and uncontainable things. Psalm 33 says, merely by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. From his breath, the stars were formed. I mean, he spoke and the world came to be. I mean, I could just like, I mean, wow, right? I I mean, I could just imagine God starting from the ground up, stars spilling out of his mouth, right? So you want a, uh, what, a burning ball of gas, 2,715,395 miles in circumference, over a million times the size of planet Earth. Sun. Or, or, or one, one's not enough. How about 200 billion stars spanning over 100,000 light years across and 100,000 light years deep? Milky Way galaxy. <laughs> Scripture says merely by his word, or if you'll allow me the liberty to sneeze, were these things effortlessly, effortlessly made. It says that there's not a star that he created that he doesn't also speak to on a first-name basis. God, he's powerful. He's beautiful. His his presence, it occupies all stars, space, and struggles. And, And Scripture tells us that this God who counts stars also counts the hairs on our head. 
And, and so maybe whether, whether you're over here thinking, man, God's really, really big, or over here thinking he's really, really small, yeah, you're right. There is no end to his presence. In this immeasurable and uncontainable God who does immeasurable and uncontainable things, he has these immeasurable, uncontainable thoughts and ways. In Isaiah, he says, but my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. And they're just not like a little bit different. He says, so far as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts, and my ways above your ways. I mean, what's he, what's he saying? He's saying that, man, I'm probably not going to do things the way that, that you would do things, right? But we don't, we don't like that. So we reduce him to a proverbial, you know, golden calf that just needs to be trained in our ways or, or you know, piece him together like some cosmic Mr. Potato Head, who, you know, using only the parts we like. French writer Voltaire said, if God made man in his image, man returned the favor. And we see that all throughout scripture, right? In 1 Samuel chapter 8, the, the Israelites, they get so fed up with a God they can't bridle that they reject him as king. They ask instead for a king that they can see, that they can control, a, a, you know, a king who will, who will go to war against the people they want to go to war against, so he gives them over to their desires. God would not be used for their political agenda, and nor will he be used for ours. Later in the scriptures, we see King Jeroboam following in the footsteps of Aaron, who to maintain the attention of his people, he sets up not one but two golden calves in his kingdom, it's sort of like as a tourist trap, right, as a geographic uh, alternative for the people who were on their way to worship God in Jerusalem. As Jeroboam put it, it would be, he'd, he'd be asking too much of people to, to travel, as if God were a thing to be worshipped in comfort and convenience. This same comfort and convenience that still traps us today when we consume Christian content online as an alternative to being devoted to a dysfunctional family he affectionately calls his bride, his church. It, 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 and, and being part of a body means greater change than you know, merely a change of plans on, on Sunday. It, it quite literally costs us you know, being an arm and a leg, a hand, or an indispensable foot. We would do well to echo King David who said, um, he said, I won't take an offer to God something that, that costs me nothing. Why? Because it wasn't worship. That wasn't worship. In fact, he actually went out of his way to be uncomfortable, to, to be inconvenienced. And, and we see this temptation play out in the way that we present the gospel. Right? A friend comes to the church, they maybe hear the gospel for the first time, this good news of, of free grace, but grace that inevitably compels us to just give our very life away. And, and when it's costly, we start making apologies for God, cringing and glossing over uncomfortable scriptures, cheating them of sanctification, offering a cross that costs nothing and weighs nothing and saves Nothing. Because what, we're embarrassed that God would, you know, be unlike us or do or think in a way that we wouldn't? In 1820, things really got out of hand. Um, Thomas Jefferson wrote what became known as the Jefferson Bible, originally titled The Life and the Morals of Jesus. And he did it by actually cutting and pasting with a razor blade numerous sections from the scripture, as he put it, taking out, excluding anything contrary to reason, only keeping the things he called authentic. And uh, it basically removed all references to, to miracles, um, any reference to the supernatural, um, or to Jesus as being divine. He preferred uh, that, you know, his Jesus was just a, a, a good teacher, 
right, who was offering up a, a new perspective on morality. You and I might, <laughs> we might not be taking a literal blade to the scriptures, but all you have to do, it doesn't take much to just look around at the global body of Christ to see that, man, we're not really all that far from it, you know? Uh, it, but instead of hacking it up with a blade, we just disfigure it by couching our edits that in terms that sound like the humble pursuit of, of truth. Like, did God really say that? Or, and if he did, did God really mean that? Not realizing that, man, these are the exact words used by the serpent in the Garden of Eden to convince us to live outside the authority of God's word. And the book of Romans warned us about this. Not just Jefferson, the Israelites, but us, a people who, although they knew God, wouldn't worship him as God, but started to think up their own foolish ideas of what God was like. It's probably why the second commandment tells us not to make images of God. Not because he's afraid that we're going like, to leave here today and go home and start you know, bowing down to some shiny livestock, but because inevitably he knows that we'll create a God who looks, acts, and thinks just like us, right? Who will, who will call us to nothing more than ourselves, who always does our bidding, who votes like we vote, thinks like we think. And answers prayers maybe the way we would answer prayers. Perhaps, worst of all, a God who loves those I love and would condemn those I would condemn. A God whose love stops at borders, certain politicians, or terrorists, like the converted terrorist named Paul who wrote most of the New Testament. When I look at Scripture, it seems to me man, that the moment we bend over and draw a line in the sand, to keep others on the outside, we'll look up and see that Jesus, he's over there with them. I mean, that's the story of Scripture, right? That's Jonah for you, who is not the protagonist, but the antagonist of the story who once Nineveh repented of its sin, sat and pouted under a tree because God offered forgiveness to people he wouldn't. I mean, Romans 8 says that nothing in all of creation, not height, not depth, not angels, not demons, not past, present, future, nothing in all of creation will prevent the love of God from reaching us. I mean, shouldn't the world, even our enemies, maybe especially our enemies, be able to say the same of his followers? That nothing in all of creation could prevent our love from reaching them. And then maybe we'll see Psalm 23 come to life in a new way where God prepares before us a feast in the presence of our enemies. Not because, not because uh, we experience a feast to the exclusion of our enemies, but because they, like us, have undeservedly been given a seat at the table of God. Imagine the kingdom beauty and this mustard seed revolution, if you will, like that we'd get to bear witness to if instead of using God for our agenda, we just allowed him to use us for his. To quote a wise man named Pastor Brian Marvel, he, he often says that, you know, many of us have found God useful. But rarely we do we just find him Beautiful. You know, there, there needs to be this a humility in having a conversation about a beautiful, breathtaking God. Coming to the table, confessing there is nothing on our plate, and we couldn't possibly comprehend what's for dinner. You know, Scripture reminds us that God is in heaven and we are on earth, so we should just let our words be few. But that he reveals himself to the humble and then teaches them his ways. Think about the moments, if you will, for a moment that truly left you speechless. Maybe it was like the you know, Grand Canyon. You were traveling, you saw the Grand Canyon at sunrise. Or maybe it was, as a kid, that moment right before you jumped off the high dive for the first time. Or uh, for me, the, the moment, you know, my bride, she turned down the aisle on our wedding day you know, 
scored some marital points there, but, <laughs> but just like your smallness juxtaposed with the majestic. It seems like in moments of unspeakable measure, the only adequate response is to just not speak at all, forfeiting the futile formation of words, to, stanley, to, to simply stand in the presence of the sacred and humbly breathe. <laughs> maybe, it's no, maybe it's no coincidence that the Hebrews' word for um, breath and for the spirit of God, are it's, it's the same word, it's ruach. Perhaps because the only accurate word to, de- to describe the indescribable spirit of God just humbly sounds like. You know, guys like the, the prophet Jeremiah knew this. When God spoke to him, ironically, the first words out of his mouth were, I don't know how to speak. Isaiah, similar experience. He recounts his experience like this. He says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on a throne, and the train of, his, train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were these seraphim calling back and forth to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And then, and then uh, Isaiah says, woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. Some translations say silenced. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I come from a land of people with unclean lips. Sure, that's a weird way to tell people where you're from. But essentially what he's saying here is whatever I say will fall infinitely short of what I see. So what then? Has God left us? Has he left us stranded with this ineffable breath or some mysterious silent Hebrew letter to be tossed about by any Uh, convincing ideology, you know, uh, campaign slogan or or catchy protest poster? How do we discern the will of the immeasurable and uncontainable while living in a very measurable and containable world and doing it faithfully? Some would have us bend the knee to relativism and just encourage us to stand in our truth. That's sort of how we got in this mess, right? When Adam and Eve decided for themselves how that they would define what good and evil was instead of trusting in God's definition. The challenge here is, is a noble one, right? Of, of trying to explain God who's so infinite, yet small enough for us to emulate, to paint a picture of God without using brush strokes so thin that he doesn't know the stars by name or, or so broad that he doesn't also know the hairs on our, our head. Left to our devices, whether it be an artificially intelligent algorithm or our own subjective sense of right and wrong, it is an impossible image to create. In the history of our faith, the prophets who misrepresented God, they, they were killed. I mean, this is like really important stuff we're talking about here. For any one of, one of us to begin a sentence with, you know, God is or, you know, God thinks should really humble us to our knees and bring us to our knees in humility. It, rem- it reminds me of this uh, quote by author Donald Miller who wrote, I no more understand the complexity of God than the pancake I ate for breakfast understands the com- complexity of me. <laughs> right? I mean, we're all just pancakes <laughs> trying to tell other pancakes what we think the chef is like. Our only hope, our only hope is that God would reveal himself. Only he could make himself small. Only the great I am could definitively say, I am anything, right? Only God could make himself down to earth. Only he could really nail himself down. And scripture says he did. We couldn't do, God did, by sending us his son. No one had ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God has made him known. This is such a big deal. I mean, think about it like this. In the Old Testament, all we really got were these just like these glimpses of God. It helps me to think of it like puzzle pieces, right? So, so God says, 
says this and, and not that and to do this or not that. So he cares about this and not that. So we're going to do this and not that. And from that, our forefathers and mothers of our faith got these little puzzle pieces to put towards this infinite image they hopelessly hoped to create. And Colossians tells us that the image was created. It, it, it was made complete. It definitively tells us that God is Jesus, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. All things in heaven and earth were created by him. And in him, get this, the fullness of God. That's an important part of this. Like in him, in Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. Ironically, this immeasurable and uncontainable God wasn't restricted when he became man, but fully revealed. I mean, sometimes I think we like to think of Jesus as I mean, God's sensitive side. You know what I mean? <laughs> And, and, and have difficulty reconciling this Old Testament God with Jesus of the new. And we're just like, oh, those pieces don't really fit, right? We just try to jam them together. But that's like being confused why a single puzzle piece doesn't look like the image, the completed image on the front of the box. Jesus was not the sweet heart, but the whole heart of God. What does this mean for us? Well, it means what he did, who he spent time around, what he said. Every God-saturated syllable, Jesus was the needed measure for this immeasurable God. And when we miss this reality, we in the church, we end up wasting a lot of time doing things that Jesus never said we should do. We end up Spent, spending our time like, like uh, not with, but avoiding the people that he would have us draw near to. And we end up talking a lot about things that Jesus never talked about. But when we get this, when, when we really get this, what happens is we start reenacting the narrative put before us by Christ, hinging our life upon his life. If this is how he loved, so will I. If this is how he forgave, so will I. And then we'll see the body of Christ faithfully living out its purpose to make visible the invisible qualities of God, both in our homes, our neighborhoods, our cities, and our world. Remember back in Sunday school, for those of you who grew up in church, you'd be sitting and in class, your teacher would ask a question, uh, but you didn't hear it because you, know, you weren't paying attention. Uh, but so you gave the Sunday school answer, right? Jesus? And nine times out of ten, you were right. <laughs> it was always a safe answer, right? But, uh, but if you're like me, you grew up, you overcomplicated things. And the good news is, is that our lives have now come full circle. Only this time, it's because we are paying attention. The answer to all we've ever wondered about God is revealed to us in Jesus. And my hope is that this, this activates, this reality, maybe this reminder activates us and, and moves us into the word specifically towards those red letters that are highlighted in so many of our Bibles, and some of our Bibles, the, the words of Christ himself. My other hope is that this reality activates and moves us, you know, into the world in, in a new prophetic way. I want to close with this. It's an old Jewish fable. Uh, it's called a midrash. It's about Abraham and his father. And it said it's in it that his father was an idol maker. Awkward family trade, right? You thought you had weird family dynamics. And, and so one day, Abraham's father, he leaves him in charge of the shop. And uh, he goes away. Uh, pretty soon, people start coming in. One person after another starts to make these sacrifices to these idols and buy these idols. And Abraham, he just gets furious. And so he takes this stick 
And he starts smashing all these idols in the shop except the biggest one, and he puts the stick in its hand. Okay, so his father later comes back into the shop, and he is irate, right? He's so angry. He sees just the chaos, and he's like, what happened here? Like, and, and Abraham, he just points to the biggest idol and says, he did it. <laughs> and, and his father replies, don't be ridiculous. These idols have no power. They can't move. And Abraham just kind of says, exactly. Psalm 115 says this, idols made by human hands, or if you allow the liberty from the mind of men, from us, our created God. Idols made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. They have these hands but can't feel. They have feet but can't walk. And those who make them will be like them. Friends, if the false God we've created can't move because he's bound by our distortions of him, then neither will we. Conversely, Scripture says that we all who with unveiled faces, meaning to see clearly the Lord's glory, that is the manifest nature of God, will be transformed into the image we see. May the image you see be Jesus as we trade in our created God for the real thing. A Jesus and consequently a people who, who have eyes that can see the image of God stamped on the unwanted, the unloved, and the uncared for. A Jesus and a people with ears that, that can hear and listen to the voice of the voiceless. A Jesus and a people with mouths to speak life into the dust and proclaim the gospel to those who are lost. A Jesus and a people who have hands to carry one another's burdens as a fulfillment of the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2. A, a Jesus in a, in a people with feet to move out of comfort zones into war zones. A Jesus in a people who are on the move. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just bow to you. We just bow to you and, and we just recognize that we're, there's like this massive chasm between us. And the larger it gets, the closer we get to you, like the larger oftentimes we realize that it actually is, and the, the larger your grace becomes, and, and the more beautiful your grace becomes. So thank you for giving us an image of, of your heart and your every intention through your son Jesus. And thank you most of all for giving yourself to us through him on the cross so that we can, we can close that chasm and be united and one with you in eternity. We praise the name of Jesus. Amen.